led to the rise of billionaires like Gates. A nose for the dollar and a knowledge of how to use the legal system to get what you want were not the only things to emerge from Bill Gates' childhood, however. His parents also encouraged discussion about the family's charity work and the causes they held close to their heart. As Gates revealed to Bill Moyers in 2003, those causes included the population issue, which sparked a lifelong interest in reproductive health. One issue that really grabbed me as, as urgent uh, was, were issues related to population, uh, reproductive health. But did you come to reproductive issues as an intellectual? When I was growing up, my parents were always involved in various uh, uh, volunteer things. My dad was uh, head of Planned Parenthood. And it was very controversial uh, to be involved with that. Gates tips his hand when he equates issues related to population with reproductive health. The topic is particularly controversial because population control and reproductive health have been used for half a century as a euphemism for eugenics, the discredited pseudoscience that holds that certain families are fit to be leaders of society by virtue of their superior genes. As we saw in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, eugenics was a field named and codified by Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin. Ostensibly concerned with heredity and what would later be known as genetics, the eugenicists believed that the rich and powerful were rich and powerful not because of luck or chance or happenstance, and certainly not from the deployment of cutthroat business tactics and underhanded dealings. No, the rich and powerful had attained their status because they came from better stock. Conversely, the poor were poor because of their defective germplasm. As transparent as it seems to us today that this ideology was a self-serving self-justification for the ruling class, it was quickly taken up as the great social crusade of the early 20th century. From Teddy Roosevelt, to H.G. Wells, to Julian Huxley, to Winston Churchill, there was widespread support for the eugenicist notion that society must strive to make sure that the rich and well-born breed as much as possible, and the poor, infirm, and feeble-minded be prevented from having children. A common eugenicist argument was that the scarce resources of society should not be used to support the lower classes, as that only encouraged more of their kind. Instead, life-saving medical care and intervention should be rationed so that those resources can be best put to use elsewhere. So-called negative eugenicists even took things further, with some, like famed playwright George Bernard Shaw, calling for people to be called before a state-appointed board to justify their existence or be put to death. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Uh, not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you, you must all know half a dozen people at least, who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. And uh, I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? But in the post-World War II era, as the name of eugenics became tarred by association with the Nazi atrocities, the talk of death panels and other harsh eugenicist notions was dropped from public conversation. Now, the quest to reduce the size of the poor population was spoken of as population control and reproductive health. Still, occasionally, these old negative eugenics ideas are revisited in moments of candor. You're raising tuitions at the University of California at the, as rapidly as they can, and so the access that used to be available to the middle class or whatever is just rapidly going away. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. It is worth questioning why this man, who openly muses about death panels and the trade-offs of providing health care to the elderly, 
is to be taken completely at face value in his attempts to slow population growth in the third world, or to handle a coronavirus health crisis that primarily affects the elderly. That the Gates' agenda is being driven by a eugenicist ideology is suggested by multiple lines of evidence, both historical and current. As we have also seen in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, the Rockefeller family was instrumental in funding and promoting eugenics, both in America and overseas. The Rockefellers helped fund the Eugenics Record Office. The founding director of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, William Welch, sat on the ERO's board and helped direct its activities. The Rockefellers sponsored the studies of the eugenics researchers at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes in Germany, including Ernst Rudin, who would go on to draft Nazi Germany's forced sterilization law. And, when the American Eugenics Society became embarrassed of its own name, its longtime director, Frederick Osborne, merely took over as president of the Rockefeller-founded Population Council. This dedication to the cause of public health did not escape the approving gaze of Bill Gates Sr. In a chapter of his 2009 book, Showing Up for Life, called Walking with Giants, he writes admiringly of the Rockefellers and their influence in the field. Every corner we've turned in the field of global health, we've found that the Rockefellers were already there and had been there for years. When we committed to childhood immunization, we found ourselves building on efforts the Rockefeller Foundation had helped launch and fund in the 1980s. When we became interested in fighting malaria and tuberculosis, we learned that the Rockefellers had been studying the prevention and treatment of such diseases around the globe for, in some cases, as long as a hundred years. A similar dynamic held true in the case of HIV-AIDS. A lesson we learned from studying and working with the Rockefellers is that to succeed in pursuing audacious goals, you need like-minded partners with whom to collaborate. And we learned that such goals are not prizes claimed by the short-winded. The Rockefellers stay with tough problems for generations. As Gates Sr. suggests, it is by working with like-minded partners that such great achievements in the field of global health can be made. For the Gates, these like-minded partners include the Rockefellers themselves. Bill Gates Sr. got to discuss global health, agriculture, and environment with the likes of David Rockefeller Sr. and David Rockefeller Jr. at a meeting on Philanthropy in a Global Century at Rockefeller University campus in 2000. And Bill Gates, as we have seen, co-hosted a meeting on reducing the population with David Rockefeller in 2009. But the most salacious hints of a deeper agenda are not to be found in the Gates's public associations, but in the associations that they have tried to hide from the public. Jeffrey Epstein may be dead, but this story isn't. A shocking new report from the New York Times sheds light on the connection between Microsoft founder Bill Gates and the late Jeffrey Epstein. After Gates's name came up in connection with Epstein and MIT Media Lab, Gates gave a statement to the Wall Street Journal where he insisted he did not have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. But new reporting from the New York Times outlines numerous meetings between Gates and Epstein and a conversation with Bill and Melinda Gates's foundation, a connection between their foundation and J.P. Morgan to set up a charitable fund that would financially benefit Epstein. You know what I want to know? Why? Beginning in August of last year, a string of information connecting Bill Gates to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein began to emerge. Flight logs revealed that Gates had flown on Jeffrey Epstein's private jet. An email surfaced showing disgraced MIT Media Lab director Joy Ito, who resigned from his position after it was discovered that he had helped cover up Jeffrey Epstein's identity as an anonymous donor to the lab, informing his staff that a $2 million donation to the lab in 2014 was a gift from Bill Gates directed by Jeffrey Epstein. As the story gained momentum, Gates tried to downplay the relationship, with a Gates spokesperson protesting that Gates didn't know it was Epstein's plane, and Gates himself insisting that, I didn't have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. This was immediately contradicted by the New York Times, who reported in October of 2012 that Gates had in fact met with Epstein on multiple occasions, even going so far as to discuss the creation of a multi-billion dollar charitable fund with seed money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase. According to the Times, Gates emailed his colleagues about Epstein in 2011. His lifestyle is very different and kind of intriguing, although it would not work for me. 
Epstein's will even named Boris Nikolich, a Harvard-trained immunologist who served as the chief scientific advisor to both Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and who appears in the sole publicly known photo of Epstein and Gates' 2011 meeting at Epstein's Manhattan mansion, as the backup executor of Epstein's estate. It is not difficult to see why Gates would try to distance himself from his relationship with a child sex trafficker. Epstein, after all, is suspected of ensnaring high-ranking politicians, businessmen, and even royalty in an intelligence-directed honeypot operation, recording them in the act of sexually abusing underage girls and using that evidence as blackmail. But, as it turns out, the attempt to suppress the Gates-Epstein story may have been an attempt to suppress the revelation of an altogether different shared interest. Sources say several accusers have come forward in New Mexico, where Epstein owns a sprawling ranch. According to a new report published in the New York Times, not verified by NBC News, Epstein wanted to use the ranch for controlled breeding, using his DNA to improve humanity. Citing two award-winning scientists and an advisor to large companies and wealthy individuals, the article reports Epstein surrounded himself with leading scientists and would tell them he wanted to have 20 women impregnated at a time on the ranch. The already scarcely believable Jeffrey Epstein story took another bizarre turn in August of 2019, when it was reported that Epstein hoped to seed the human race with his DNA. As the New York Times explained, Epstein's plan to impregnate 20 women at a time at his New Mexico ranch in order to seed the human race with his DNA, a plan he told to a number of the scientific luminaries he kept in his orbit, put a modern gloss on a very old idea. Mr. Epstein's vision reflected his long-standing fascination with what has become known as transhumanism, the science of improving the human population through technologies like genetic engineering and artificial intelligence. Critics have likened transhumanism to a modern-day version of eugenics, the discredited field of improving the human race through controlled breeding. Epstein's interest in genetics led him to sponsor a number of scientists working in the field, including George Church, a Harvard geneticist whose lab received funding from Epstein's foundation from 2005 to 2007 for cutting-edge science. Church publicly apologized for his connection to Epstein, which included several meetings a year from 2014 onward. This was neither the first nor the last time that this unassuming Harvard biologist, whose cutting-edge science often strays into controversial areas, caused a public scandal. In 2019, Church proposed a genetics dating app, which was immediately denounced as applied eugenics. Church also acted as scientific advisor to Editas Medicine, a startup seeking to use the genome editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 to eliminate diseases by deleting the parts of a genetic code responsible for the illness. In 2015, the company announced it had raised $120 million from a group led by Epstein's appointed backup executor, Dr. Boris Nikolich. Naturally, that group of investors included Bill Gates. Yes, Bill Gates is certainly following his father's advice to collaborate with like-minded partners. So the question remains, is Bill Gates motivated by eugenics? Given that eugenics went underground over half a century ago, we are unlikely ever to unearth a frank admission along those lines from Gates himself. 